Thanks, John. And I'd uh, especially like to acknowledge John Milne, who's um, doing his royal tour of Australia. Uh, John, it's great you could, you could be out here and, and uh, tour around and, and meet uh, as many of the rangeland folk around the countryside uh, as, as possible. Uh, on, to, uh, on to my talk. Uh, so yeah, titled, uh, Is Proactive Adaptation to, uh, to uh, Climate Change Necessary in Grazed Rangelands? Really to, to stimulate some, some thinking in that, that rangelands are, are by their very nature highly variable. And uh, does this predispose them to, to, uh, to adaptation uh, to climate change? So are they, are they pre-prepared to deal with it and therefore don't need to think about it in any special way? Just business as usual. We've done, we can deal with climate variability. Let's just get on with it and it uh, and doesn't matter if a bit of climate change comes along. So that's the, the question I'm, uh, I'm posing today. Uh, just, uh, just one slide of, uh, of introduction around the rangelands for, for the, the few. I don't think there's too many people here that, that are unfamiliar with rangelands, but occupy a significant uh, part of the, of the Earth's surface, uh, about 50%, and uh, are home to 2 billion people, and about a billion of those directly dependent on, on natural resources from, from rangelands. So a very significant uh, uh, activity and, and land use uh, around the world. Uh, because John was coming, I thought, oh, well, I need to connect back to, to something that, that John was involved in. And in 2005, John ran a, uh, a workshop in uh, Glasgow, uh, Pastoralism in uh, Marginal Environments. And I gave a, a talk there. And just to show things that don't move on very far, I've drug, uh, dug a slide up from, from that uh, presentation around. But it's really to highlight the issue of climate variability in, uh, as a defining feature of rangelands. And just this, this graph, just to show you that the, 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 the box down the, the bottom here uh, is really the, the mesic areas, so the non-rangeland areas of the world where rainfall is, is high enough uh, and usually not very variable and, uh, and is, so, is used for usually other activities. So a lot of these areas in here, in fact, would be croplands uh, in, in many parts of the world or at, at least very least uh, highly developed pasture systems. Uh, but when you move outside that, that box, you've got rangelands which are characterised uh, by both, uh, well, by low rainfall, uh, uh, or sorry, by high variability as a defining feature. Uh, and that can be low rainfall, or generally low t to modest amounts of rainfall. But in some cases, uh, you can even have relatively higher levels of rainfall as in the tropical rangelands of, of northern Australia. The, the other feature to note there is, uh, particularly in the Australian context, and Australia being the blue stars there, that we... Uh, tend to win out in terms of the variability stakes uh, when you compare it with other rangelands around the world. So some comparison sites there in, in Africa and Europe, Asia and North America and, and nearly all the Australian ones, in fact all of them are, uh, when you compare them for each unit of rainfall, a higher level of variability. So it's a defining feature of all rangelands, but especially so in Australia. Uh, and that variability increases as it cascades through the system. So if we just show here some various sites from around the world that, and the mean rainfall, uh, the coefficient of variation of that rainfall, the, the second line down, and the net primary productivity, and then the, the coefficient of variation around the net primary productivity. Now I'm talking about pasture productivity. And you can see that, that as you go from rainfall through to pasture productivity, that that variability increases even more. So that, that provides uh, particular challenges for, for managers in dealing with that that variability. Of course, in rangelands, uh, it's not just about climate variability. The whole lot of other physical and social features of the rangelands that makes them quite different environments to, to anywhere else, uh, in a, at least in an agricultural context. Uh, and this is just a description of, of, of how a number of these factors come together in terms of uh, the, the climate, not just the climate, but issues of, of remoteness, uh, sparse populations, limited livelihoods in, in what has been uh, classified as, I guess, the desert syndrome when you get into the, particularly into the dry, dry range ends. And, and drawing here on a, on a figure from Mark Stafford-Smith where you bring a lot of those factors together around not just uh, climate uncertainty but social uncertainty, economic uncertainty. And so you have a, uh, a challenging environment for the range ends, but one which has shaped them and is all part of that, that, that thesis that... Uh, well, maybe that, that conveys uh, special ability to deal with, uh, with some new challenges in the form of, of climate change. 
Uh, the, other, the other side of it, like, well, Tony Preslin's here. I can, I've got a, uh, this, article, this is just an article from a uh, guest editorial lead from Tony in an issue of the journal um, uh, earlier this year. Uh, the, the other feature of, of, of range has been defined around range is, is around adaptive management and building resilience. And of course, in, in adapting to both climate variability and change, uh, uh, being resilient, uh, being able to adapt to, to circumstances and having adaptive management strategies in, in place are really important. So uh, that's another feature of the range hands that you might argue is, is helps them in, in uh, pre-adapting to the shocks of, of climate change. Uh, so that does, and, and that, I'm just using that to again frame this question, uh, can rangeland managers adapt to, to climate change autonomously as it unfolds? So that basically just deal with it without any special uh, planning or proactive uh, uh, actions put in place. Of course the, the alternative is that, that rangelands are highly vulnerable and uh, because of the, some of those features I was just talking about, so there's a flip side to this, um, and, and the climate change will push them uh, beyond their coping range in many situations, uh, particularly where they're used for uh, commercial uh, livestock produ production or even su subsistence livestock production. So that's the flip side of that and, and the result of that at the bottom is that proactive adaptation is required. A lot more thought needs to go into, into uh, adaptation to climate change than perhaps is, is currently occurring in rangelands. So that's the, the flip side of the, uh, of the hypothesis. So I just want to start on autonomous adaptation and uh, ask the question, uh, how well do we do it? Uh, Greg McKeon's here, uh, so drawing on this, this seminal bit of work at Greg and Grant Stone and others uh, the, in the audience here around pasture degradation and recovery in, in Australia's rangelands, that uh, puts the case that if you look back in history, we, we haven't been particularly good at dealing at, at, at these shocks of natural variability where they've extended over uh, periods of time, where we've had either very deep, deep droughts over long periods of time or, or very sharp droughts even over shorter periods of of time, and uh, so from that you could you could argue that um, well we're not so good at adapting to existing variability. While while we claim that to be a great feature of of rangeland managers, that when you look start to look at the evidence of, of past events, that we haven't necessarily been too successful at it. And as a consequence, there's a lot of rangeland areas of Australia and other parts of the world that are still suffering. Uh, from the after effects of some of those, those drought events and the inability of managers to cope with them and as a consequence issues of overstocking and uh, decline in the resource base. The, uh, the, the next one around autonomous adaptation which you could put in the, the class of, uh, it, it is a positive feature where people have been able to respond and I'm just using one here around social aspects uh, and economic aspects is, is adjustment and uh, social networks. So this is where people, largely through informal networks, uh, they're, they're obviously commercialised eventually because people pay money to, to send their animals to, to other regions or, or other parts of the same region that aren't suffering the same uh, climatic stress to, to house their cattle, feed their cattle uh, until their, their pasture recovers. Now, this is actually comes from that wonderful AgMates uh, website, um, which I very rarely visit, but they do put adjustment ads uh, up there. But I, I do actually wonder if, when you're advertising for adjustment and you've got a, a, an animal like that with horns about uh, half a metre long, whether you're really, <laughs> really looking to attract uh, uh, customers. But anyway, uh, I thought I thought those sort of animals <laughs> should be long gone from the north. But uh, uh, anyway, it's really just to highlight the point that that. That is a form of, of adaptation to climatic variability, which has worked to, to greater or lesser extent. Uh, there are some, some reasonable social networks out there, and Ryan McAllister and co have done quite a bit of work on this aspects of, of adjustment and social networks, but also show that those, weeks, uh, those links between uh, pastoralists are often fairly weak, and it doesn't take much to break them. Uh, so it's not necessarily a very robust or resilient form of adaptation in the context of, of uh, stronger shocks. Uh, and even where tools are available, autonomous, autonomous adaptation is not guaranteed. And I'm going to use the example here of seasonal climate forecasts. 
Uh, Australia's been at the forefront of, of seasonal f climate forecasting, uh, partly because of our variable climate, uh, or largely, you might say, and, uh, and the opportunity that people saw to, to use uh, in information in the climate system, particularly in a continent like Australia, which is so strongly driven, at least in the eastern half of the continent, by uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation uh, and its influences on, on drought and, and, uh, and very wet seasons. So th the map on the left is uh, just a, a map from the Bureau of Meteorology, which is effectively giving a, a, a measure of forecast skill. And it's for the, in, in uh, September, uh, for, uh, for the October, November, December period, uh, for, for rainfall. And uh, the, the darker the red means it's, the, there's more, it's higher skill, there's more consistency between the forecast and what the observation was in that three month period. So for North East Queensland there, for example, that it's up in the order of 70 or 75 per cent consistency between a seasonal forecast issued in, in September and the resulting uh, outcome in that October to December period. Uh, so you, you have to argue at least, uh, it's not, the forecast skill isn't great uh, all over the, over the country or all over the rangelands for that matter. But in that particular location uh, in northeast Queensland, the forecast skill is good. And uh, Nadine Marshall uh, and others uh, did some work just a, a couple of years ago around the, the use of seasonal going out to about 100 plus properties and doing in-depth interviews uh, around uh, the, the Dalrymple Shire area, north of Charters Towers area of northeast Queensland, to see what might be some of the impediments to the use of, of seasonal climate forecasts. And, in responding, 90% of them said that, that knowing that it was going to be a rainy season of advance would help them plan accordingly. But very few of them are actually planning accordingly. Uh, and, and when you, tied, when you de delved in a little more deeply, there was low confidence in the economic benefits that those forecasts. So even though they said they can help them plan, they, they didn't have a lot of confidence that they were going to deliver anything financially. And there's al there was also a very strong element to arise from that was the issue of adaptive capacity in that the, the uptake of forecast was, very, was negatively correlated with, with what's called resource dependency. So the more tightly bound you are to, to, to the land and the country, which you think, well, that, that should really inform you, but it actually, uh, you can't see the wood for the trees almost. You, it's so tightly bound to what, what's in front of you, what you've got to do on a day-to-day -day basis, that you can't lift your head up strategically to, to look at, at uh, what might be required. And there was a very strong correlation between people who are in that, that uh, realm and, and those versus those who were perhaps a little more, you might say, uh, not disconnected, but, but harder nosed and dispassionate about what they were seeing in front of them. Uh, and then moving on to another, another area where perhaps autonomous adaptation is, is, doesn't play out in the way that we, we might uh, desire, uh, in this case in terms of drought and drought policy. Uh, and this, these just a couple of quotes here from uh, the, the, the report on dryness, uh, social perspectives of that, that was done uh, a year or so ago. Uh, Peter Kenny, who unfortunately passed away uh, uh, just recently, was, uh, was a key player in that. But uh, for, for a number of, uh, for particularly producers who, who do have a, a reasonable idea of how to manage climate variability, they felt that the, the drought policies that were in place and, and uh, there's a, a review and, and piloting of different drought policies going on at the moment, but feeling that, that really there are no benefit in he helping people adapt to these sorts of events. It, it actually just props them up and masks uh, uh, issues of, of management. So I, I want to move on now and, uh, and uh, go from that, that setting and saying, well, autonomous adaptation uh, if, if it was working well in a highly variable climate, we wouldn't see some of those features I just described there where, where things are not, not happening as, as we, might, uh, we might like. So if we start to move forward and say, well, in that context, how might f uh, future climate impact the rangelands and, and what additional challenges does that throw up? Uh, so climate is, and I'm drawing here on some work that, uh, that Chris Stokes and I have been uh, involved in for a few years. Um, so. The, Climate is shifting from, from past experience and, and we just here have got the, the uh, temperature record uh, for the last 100 years. 
So we've, we've got a warming, a warming climate and it's not just shifting from that historical record, uh, it's also shifting in the way that we tend, we, we use models and, and I've got over there the last 50 years or so, we, we tend to use these models as a reflection of a, of a stable climate but, but even in the period of, that we're operating these models we've got, we've got the climate uh, shifting. So it's, uh, it poses some, some challenges for us in, in, uh, in creating a, a, a stable baseline on which to, to think how, we, how the climate change might uh, affect us. Uh, and this is all tied up with, with issues of, of uncertainty uh, and so as I go through the next few slides it will be about moving from, from certainty to uncertainty in, uh, in, in the way that, that climate might affect rangelands and just the challenges you run into and we're seeing this very much played out in, the, in newspapers at the moment uh, around, uh, we had a IPCC re re released a uh, special report on extremes uh, a week or so ago, we've just in the last day or so had some more emails uh, released uh, from East Anglia uh, which surprise, surprise happened a few days before Durban talks uh, which is um, very convenient but, but it's just the issues that here in demonstrating this, this cartoon that, that how, how different views or perceptions of, of certainty and uncertainty can be twisted around to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to come up with different uh, results. So if we, if we now look at how things more directly affect the rangelands and, and CO2, uh, the things that might affect livestock plant growth and livestock production in the future and the, direct, the effects here around CO2, temperature and rainfall, all, all potentially affecting uh, climate change. You're going to have direct effects of temperature and, and uh, even rainfall on animals. So that dotted line there at the left, uh, direct effects down on livestock production. And then some of the other effects uh, occurring secondarily through uh, forage production in the case of the, the, the next box over, yellow forage and vegetation. Then through to, to natural resources, it might be the the, the tree grass composition that, that is in say savanna systems in the north uh, through to uh, pests and diseases which would, uh, will affect uh, livestock production uh, either, either directly as affect on the animals or, or uh, likewise can be indirect through things like the, the pasture based system. And then over at the right is the, the human responses and, and context which is how do you adapt to all that. So I just want to step through uh, some of these drivers of, of uh, change for the range ants to see what impact they might, they might have. So if we deal with, with carbon dioxide first, which is it's the most certain of all the things that are changing. Uh, we've, uh, it's, gone, uh, it's gone up from 280 parts per million to 390 uh, since in, uh, industrial times, about a plus 40% increase uh, and it goes up steadily each year by uh, two or three parts per million. So it's uh, it's something we're most certain about. Uh, it's most immediate in terms of its, its effects and, and most uniform in that it's across the whole globe. Uh, and we do know that it improves water use efficiency uh, from both uh, laboratory uh, or glasshouse studies and, and also field experiments. Uh, it improves uh, uh, nitrogen use uh, efficiency and there's also improved photosynthesis uh, uh, or improved plant growth rather through, uh, uh, through light use efficiency. Uh, and and so that all has positive impacts on, uh, on plant growth. So if we look at those effects when we, we bring them together, uh, you have increased, increased resource use efficiency, uh, which stimulates growth, so better, better use of water, uh, better use of, of nitrogen, uh, though it's, uh, it's worth saying, that, and it goes on to the next point there around reduced forage quality. So even though there's improved nitrogen use efficiency, much of that... Uh, that, that nitrogen, even though it's more eff effectively taken up, it's done so against a, a backdrop of, of overall increased productivity, so, so you actually end up with poorer forage quality uh, as a consequence, even though you've got improved nitrogen use efficiency. So there's lower protein and digestibility for the animals. Uh, you do have some benefits, particularly in intermediate seasons that have, that have had rainfall sporadically uh, delivered throughout the season that uh, you, you have prolonged, because of improved water use efficiency, you have a little bit more moisture available at the end of the season, which can have uh, particular benefits. Uh, and the last point there, which is often uh, not, not uh, really appreciated and, and could, in fact, in, in the medium term, be one of the bigger impacts, uh, is shifts in vegetation composition. 
uh, both within the, within the herbaceous layer, uh, from work done in North Queensland uh, by, by Chris Stokes and, and uh, a few other uh, scientists that uh, has demonstrated changes in that grass layer, or in, in that case, uh, kangaroo grass, Themida, was, was, was pre benefited from the higher CO2 as opposed to some of the other perennial grass species. Uh, but more importantly, the, the tree seedlings in the systems, the, the eucalypt and the, uh, and the acacia tree seedlings in the system, uh, grew at a much faster rate or responded to CO2, in this case elevated CO2, at a, at, a, at a better rate or faster rate than the grass species. So potential there to shift in savanna systems, the tree grass balance, quite significantly. Uh, if we look at uh, uh, temperature in terms of, of warming, uh, We've got a primary effect of, of, of rising greenhouse gases on, on the climate system and then the, through, through radiator forcing, but then we've got feedback effects uh, through then, uh, through particularly uh, through the, the, the atmosphere warming and uh, being able to retain more moisture and that, 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 that water vapour then have been a positive feedback effect so that, that by uh, the end of the century, we could have between you know one and a half and, and upwards uh, up to, to six or so degrees C increase in, in temperature, and a, a one degree C shift in temperature means about 145 kilometre uh, shift uh, in, in latitudes. Uh, the, the, the lags in temperature are behind greenhouse gases, so we've we've built some some temperature increase into the system, even if we started to to reduce our emissions soon. And there is a bit of geographic variation there in the sense that, that the interior parts of continents warm at a faster rate than, the, than the, uh, the, the coastal areas, the maritime area, just because of the maritime influence. And of, uh, that temperature increase will affect both, both plants and animals uh, uh, to various degrees. Uh, so in terms of those effects on plants and animals, that, that through vegetation there's likely to be reduce water use efficiency and, and increased evaporation. Uh, there's also, because of the, the rates of growth there, uh, declines in, in digestibility. Uh, in, in cooler climates, there might be some benefits in an earlier start to the, to the, to the growing season. Uh, and there's likely to be some poleward expansion of, of tropical weeds. Um, in, in terms of livestock, it, there's likely to be some, some direct stress effects. Uh, we've, uh, one of the adaptations to, to existing Climate stresses in, in uh, an Australian environment, in northern Australia, has been to, to bring on Brahmin cattle, of course, and, uh, uh, and they're w pretty well adapted to our, our existing stresses, but there's questions, and, and even with the existing climate, they do struggle at times, and there's, under future climate, there's, there's potentially some additional stresses, uh, even for uh, a species like, uh, or uh, Boss indicus type animals. Uh, you're likely to get more concentration around water points as well. And again, pests and diseases spreading southwards uh, or, or polewards in the case of the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, rainfall is, has the greatest impact, but we're going down in terms of decreasing uncertainty. So it's the least certain of all the, of all the impacts uh, the, of, uh, through climate change. Uh, and it's, it, it's also most geographically variable, and so that makes it very difficult when you're trying to, to look at what might happen in the future when you've got those uncertainties both around the amount of rainfall and, and issues of, of geographic pattern. Uh, that said, we are, th there's reasonable confidence that, that rainfall is declining in the mid-latitudes, and this is around the world, not just in Australia, uh, and in the tropics there's either little change or, if anything, uh, an increase in, in rainfall. Just because of the intensification of the hydrological cycle, um, and, uh, extreme events, intense events, uh, are likely to be to be increasing, and uh, and and as a like as a result of that, where uh, all the combination of those factors, we're likely to see uh, bigger rainfall events inters interspersed with with longer dry periods. So, when uh, and drawing here some again some work from Greg. Uh, and others that was published in the Rangeland Journal a couple of years ago uh, on climate change and, and the rangelands. Uh, when you put some of these factors together and, and putting the most certain ones together, so we start off with CO2, we're certain about that, uh, picking a scenario around uh, temperature increase, in this case three degrees C temperature increase, 
but having a range of scenarios for rainfall because we're, we're least certain about those, uh, those scenarios that we need to, to look at, at, the, at the responses there. And you can see here that the graphs here, the maps here, uh, uh, indicate forage uh, production uh, with the, the red and yellows being declines in, in production and the, and the blues being increases in production. You can see the, the very powerful effect changes in rainfall have on, on productivity in the rangelands, which is not, not, not surprising. Uh, uh, and uh, the, the, the sensitivity there, even, even to small changes in rainfall, uh, so where we've got, for example, when you, when you uh, have a 10% a decrease in rainfall, you can end up with you know, up to a, a 20% or so decrease in, in forage production in different parts of the, of the country. Uh, the thing to, to keep in mind here is, is how some of this uncertainty plays out. Uh, and, and here's just, it might be a difficult graph to, to interpret fairly quickly, but it's, it's just to highlight, uh, and here's an example for, for Victoria River Downs District in, in the Northern Territory, that how these temperature scenarios start to play out as you go, as you go forward. Uh, so if we, uh, if we look at the, uh, the figure there behind us on the, on the y-axis there, the zero line, there, so that's where we're getting no temperature increase. So it's, it's model runs done, uh, global circulation model runs done without any greenhouse gas forcing. So what you'd expect is, is obviously uh, uh, no temperature change and uh, in this case no rainfall change. Uh, as you start to go up, and this is, this is displayed in terms of temperature going up by one, two, three, four degrees C, that uh, you can see the, the, dis the dispersal in the model outcomes, and each of these dots represents uh, a different, different uh, realisation from global circulation models that as you go further into the, particularly into the future, but, but really as temperature increases, that, that that uncertainty band widens. And uh, so it's just to highlight, we've always got to keep these uncertainties uh, in mind when, when uh, talking about uh, uh, climate change, particularly when we get into to the realms of, of 2050 to 2070. And uh, in this particular example, it's uh, for the VRD there, you can see you've got an almost an equal distribution of, uh, of those model runs showing an increase in rainfall uh, versus those that show a decrease in rainfall. So for that, for that situation, it, that doesn't mean there's, the, the information isn't uh, useful, it, it, it is still useful, but it, it means you've just got to look at a, at a range of scenarios where, which ha have both increasing and decreasing rainfall. So in putting that together, can, can uh, ask the question, can autonomous adaptation cope with these uh, projected uh, changes? And uh, if we, we start off just looking at a, at a few of these different uh, uh, variables here, if you have a two degree C uh, temperature increase, so and that's increasingly unavoidable. The the changes are probably fairly gradual, in, and that it's, it's probably we can cope with those up to a two degree C change in terms of our strategies around animal breeding for heat tolerance, uh, altered herd and grazing management, additional shade, altered fire regimes, whole range of management uh, actions that are put in place now uh, would probably allow us to cope with a two degree C increase. Uh, in terms of decreasing rainfall, again, those changes will be gradual and can cope with them up to a point in time. But, but as that, that map, spatial maps before showed of, of forage production and decreases in rainfall, it, it uh, doesn't take, you know, by the time you start to get a t to, a, say, a 20% decrease in rainfall, uh, in forage production, that, that will start to pose stresses in uh, economic viability of, of some of our, uh, of our systems. Uh, people can cope with that over a, f over a few years uh, during drought periods uh, to greater or lesser extent, extent but if we, we put that into a permanent setting, uh, we can see things uh, playing out where, where systems shift. And, and we see that in, already we're starting to see that in southwest Western Australia where we've had a climate shift there for 30 years and that's starting to play out now in, in the cropping areas at least where some of those are transitioning uh, in the marginal areas are uh, starting to transition into, into livestock production, interestingly. Yeah. Uh, and the last one there, so there's likely to be some thresholds crossed there where our current adaptation strategies will not be sufficient uh, in terms of decreasing rainfall. In terms, and then if we look at variability, increases in extreme variability, extreme events coming, uh, if, if uh, they increase in frequency and or intensity, particularly uh, recurring more frequently, 
then that really will push distance. We're seeing in a whole lot of other areas, uh, people can often cope with one extreme event, but getting another one soon after uh, often pushes people over the edge. So uh, just framing this up in, uh, in terms of time and scale of adaptation response with, with climate change here along the, the x-axis and the benefit from adaptation and what this, it, the shell diagram. So for a while, some of the adaptations are really just extensions of what we're doing now in terms of existing. Uh, uh, and th and this, this graph here is for all agricultural <laughs> systems. It's not, not just rangeland. So some work from Mark Howden and, and co. Uh, and you can change in a cropping system, change varieties, planting times, uh, a variety of things that are stubble, water, nutrient management can all be done now. Uh, as climate change starts to take, uh, take hold a little more significantly, we can start to move to and use new technologies, uh, climate-ready crops. Uh, for example, quite a lot of work going on now around breeding crops for a future climate, taking advantage of, of a higher CO2 environment. Uh, starting to breed for a higher temperature rather than just breeding for drought tolerance, for example. Uh, so we have a range of, of technologies uh, and, and uh, other forms of, of, uh, of adaptation, diversification that can come to start into play. But as, as the climate change becomes even more significant, uh, to, to, to get some benefits from adaptation, we have to start to move more into some tr transformational type uh, type changes and the complexity and risk associated with this also escalates. So it's, it's not an easy transition and it brings with it a lot of challenges. Uh, so what I'd, I'd argue out of all that is that, that reactive and autonomous adaptation is insufficient. It's not, it's not saying that it's not something we, we shouldn't do, we need to do it and, it and it makes perfect sense to be adapting to existing climate variability even better than we're doing it now as a early adaptation to climate change. But th the reality is that, that particularly if we go beyond uh, two degrees C increase, that, that we will need to start reframing our adaptation responses and it will mean changed priorities and, it, and once we start to go beyond that, uh, that sort of threshold, reactive or autonomous adaptation will probably not be sufficient. So what are some, and I'm just going to finish up now in a, in a few slides with uh, some information or some areas where we might be able to start planning now, not saying we have to do everything now, but start putting in place some, some frameworks for dealing with, with climate change in a more proactive way. And the first is around information and decision making frameworks. So what, one of the responses from people is to say, well, okay, if, before we can plan better, we just need more certain information around the climate. And so the immediate response is, let's just give us, give us more information we see this all the time. People say, can I have climate projections, more accurate climate projections for my patch? Uh, and if I get that information, everything will be fine. Uh, well, the reality is that, that the uncertainties won't reduce. Uh, all of them won't reduce. There's some irre irreducible uncertainties in, in our ability to, to uh, predict the climate system. And so it's, that's just not going to happen. So we need to move beyond that, that information deficit model into one that is based more on scenarios, knowing that some of those uncertainties are, are irreducible. The, the other one is that we have almost no information on the economics uh, or the costs and benefits of adaptation, uh, particularly in the rangelands. Uh, which there's just some work starting on that, but there's, there's very little, uh, there's work done from, from e e climate variability, but in terms of climate change, uh, it's, it's something which is, which is underdone. So in terms of technology and management system responses, what can we start doing there around, in, around planning? Uh, and it's fair to say that in, in rangelands, there's probably relatively fewer options than in other more intensive agricultural systems. Uh, and just uh, on the right-hand side there, a uh, figure there of some uh, biodegradable polymers that have been developed now for, for putting over crops to, to improve their microclimate in dealing with, with uh, uh, water stresses at, at the time of planting that might be brought on by a reduced rainfall and, and that's an adaptation which has got a lot of potential in, in cropping systems to, to one aspect of, of climate change. Uh, really just to highlight the point there around fewer options. Now one is in, in livestock breeding in, in adaptation to, to change climate and because of the lag period in breeding uh, we're often talking uh, decades uh, to, to bring on new breeds in, in crops or in, in livestock 
So that needs to start, people need to be thinking about that now, not, not in, tw in 20 years' time saying, oh, it would be nice if we had some animals that are better adapted to, uh, to different conditions. Uh, in terms of manipulation of vegetation composition, I raised the issues before about particularly CO2, but also rain, uh, temperature and rainfall, that, that some of the manipulations available to us are not something which is going to change vegetation composition overnight. There's something that's got to be worked at over a long period of time, whether it be, uh, for example, fire management. It's, it's not going to be a, a panacea with one, one event. And so planning and thinking about, and, and that's starting to happen soon, is needed. Uh, we, we're, for example, in, in our flagship program doing quite a lot of work on gen understanding genetic variation in, in uh, plant traits to higher CO2 and, uh, and temperature, uh, not just in crops, but in, uh, we're looking at eucalypts and other species as well, to see if we can, uh, well, one, understand that genetic variability, to, to see what natural adaptations might be there, you know, how, how might plants uh, and animals uh, adapt naturally, but also how you might exploit that. Uh, in terms of, of, of breeding programs in the future. And the last point there is exploiting spatial variability. Now, this is probably taking a more sophisticated approach to, to uh, ways that we currently exploit spatial variability. I used adjustment before as one. People have multiple properties as another, as another way. But we can take a range of ways to, to, to address that. The third area is around institutional policy and behavioural responses. And this is in many ways where we, we probably need the most thinking uh, in terms of issues of land use and, la and land tenure because if, if areas move, uh, you know, become unviable in their current forms of production, how are, we gonna, uh, how are we gonna use those areas of land? How do we transition? Uh, issues of structural adjustment. And we need to, in the context of climate change, be thinking about that now because of the, the very long time frames in, we know in, in bringing about policy changes. Uh, uh, drought and other support policies, as I said, it's, it's under review now. Uh, and so we, we, uh, we need to be thinking of that not just in the current climate but, but in future climate. Uh, the third area there is around ecosystem services, uh, carbon and biodiversity. Thinking about climate adaptation, uh, well, we shouldn't be thinking about it in isolation from some of the other drivers with, uh, going on. We've just got a carbon farming initiative passed and it will intersect with the, with the rangelands uh, fairly, fairly strongly, I think, as we go forward over the next few years. So. We need to be thinking about our, our adaptation responses, not just in an on-farm on sense, but, but in a policy sense also around uh, how, do we, how do we link adaptation and mitigation much more closely. Uh, and, and lastly there, the governance and institutional arrangements for the rangelands. I started off by saying, using that desert syndrome diagram, that it's already a, a completely different place which suffers from the fact that uh, it's a long way from, from uh, where people make big decisions in, in Canberra or other, in other countries in, in capital areas. And that's only going to likely worsen as the world urbanises. We've just passed 50% of the world's population living in cities. Uh, by 2050, when climate change will be really uh, taking effect, we're going to have 80% of the world's population living in cities. So rangelands will be even more marginalised places. Uh, uh, that can all be pretty challenging, but I just want to give an example here where people are starting to, to think about this in a, in a robust way. And I'm going somewhere completely different, over, over somewhere near John's Patch, but the, the Thames Barrier, uh, which is just the, the photo up there on the Thames, which is in, uh, one of the events where they've had to close the, close the barrier. And it's, I think, just in the last couple of years, they closed it for the 100th time. Um, and it's, the number of times the barrier is closed is tripled in the last... 15 years, uh, the, the frequency of, of, of closure. So that's in response to even the modest level of, of uh, sea level rise and, and other factors coming into play. So in, in terms of the, the management of that, that barrier, they've thought about a whole range of strategies. What can they do in the context of, of different levels of, of uh, at the top there going across one, two, three, four metres change in, in, uh, in, in sea level and how that might affect. So starting off looking at, at, at options around them, improving the existing defences uh, uh, and, uh, and going all the way down through to, to, to a new barrier using the existing structure there, but a new barrier, but, but all the way through to an to entirely new barrage, uh, which is you know, a, a multi, multi-billion dollar investment. And uh, so they've charted a pathway for the future uh, 
saying that, that to start off with, to deal with the lower levels of, of, um, of uh, climate change, you, you go down to some flood storage defences, uh, you improve the, the Thames barrier, but you reach a point in time uh, when, you, when you think it's going to exceed two metres where you, you need to actually go down and invest in, in the barrage. So that's a lot of thinking about some issues uh, well out into the, into the future, but putting in place actions now. So it's, a, it's a, quite a nice example of how you can go about planning for the future where you've got, got uncertainty uh, and taking a proactive approach. So I'll conclude by saying that the adaptation is, is needed in the rangelands. Uh, uh, incremental adaptation building on current approaches is, is okay for a time, uh, but, but longer term planning and thinking about transformational changes uh, is needed. But, but in that, there's, there's a real challenge of, of, of when and how much to respond when you think about transformational change. It's, it's easy to say, well, we need it, but, but uh, it often uh, comes with a cost, and so you need to think about where and when so that you get, uh, you're making the right decisions in, in the right time frames. 